Hello, everyone, and welcome to the SAS VIA Release Highlight Show. My name is Tiago de Souza, and I have some very fun news to share with you today. We will be looking at the batting lab from SAS and how SAS Econometrics powers the technology to help baseball and softball players improve their swing. It's a really cool combination of computer vision, artificial intelligence, and machine learning that teaches kids the importance of data literacy and helps them learn about data through a fun experience. We actually have a video here to tell you more about this project that SAS is really proud of. Let's roll the clip. I love baseball. I like hitting the most. I really like to bat. I play third base pitcher. Center field. First pitcher and third. Data. Hmm. The Batting Lab is a smart batting cage that uses SAS advanced technology to help players understand how their swings can be improved. We gathered hundreds of swings from elite players and then used that to create an optimal form. And then we collect the information of the player's swing inside the Batting Lab and compare it to that optimal swing in order to give feedback to the player about how they could improve. The cage is awesome, how it can just find out the problem to my swing. Remember to push those hands forward parallel to the box. Keeps telling me that I lean too far back when I swing, which is definitely true. I do that a lot. <laughs> I've learned a lot more about how to read data. I thought it was just going to be like a normal batting cage. This makes it kind of easier to understand and something fun to do. One time I hit it, it went so fast. I understand more like charts and graphs because of the cage. I've just overall improved in analyzing data and understanding it. It's a whole new ball game now, everybody. What did you think of that video? I for love, I for one love seeing analytics and sports come together like this. Which brings us to our question of the day. What would be your walk-up song? In case you don't know, a walk-up song is set to play when a player walks out onto the field at the start of the game. It's a song a player chooses themselves because its energy best represents what they will bring to the game. My current walk-up song would probably be N95 by Kendrick Lamar, but I'm curious what your walk-up song is. Let me know in the chat. And while you do, ladies and gentlemen, it's time for our first segment. Let's touch base with Kate Uveling and learn more about the batting lab. Hi, Kate. Hey, Tiago, how are we doing today? I'm doing great, I hope you are as well. I am, I'm so glad that we get to be back on the show together to touch on such a cool project. I was listening to your walk-up song all morning, getting myself typed up for the show today. <laughs> uh, all in all, I just love how the batting lab helps these young athletes gain confidence on and off the field. Yeah, it's a true home run of a project and it's such a creative way to bring data literacy into their lives at such a young age. It's so important for them to learn. So Kate, it I believe we is. also have a batting lab demo with uh, data scientist Jared Dean, is that right? You've got that right, yeah, we do. So let's get this demo into full swing, ladies and gentlemen. Do it. All right. So here we are on the SAS.com batting lab, batting lab website, and we're going to roll through, we're going to scroll through this interactive demonstration. I'm going to talk about some of the aspects and features from a technology perspective that made the batting lab happen. And so we're going to go ahead and just scroll through this experience. And the first thing to do is we're going to talk about some sensors. And so the first sensor that we need to understand is that we had to identify when did a swing happen? That was the thing we were analyzing. And so we have a microphone set up directly above the T where the batter hits the ball in order to identify the point of contact. From that point of contact, we can then take a, create a video that's a few seconds before and a few seconds after to capture the entirety of the swing. So that was the first sensor that was in place here in order to help make this experience happen and come to life. As we move in and scroll forward, then what we have is we have um, we have some sensors. And so what we do is we have cameras that are placed opposite the batter 
that are capturing this video and they're on a, on a buffer loop. So they're taking constant video. And then when we hear that contact swing through the, through the microphone, we then create a video of that swing and send it off to be processed. The cameras that we're using are capturing video at about 60 frames a second, similar to what you get on, on an iPhone or Android phone. And we're doing that in part because we want to be able to take it at a high enough frame rate to detect the changes that happen through the swing, but not so much video that it takes a long time to process. Because if you think about a video as a collection of pictures, what we're doing is we're breaking down every picture in that video into a particular frame, and then we're analyzing that frame to identify basically the pose. Pose estimation is a, is a sub part of computer vision which is a sub part of artificial intelligence. And so pose estimation basically identifies where all of your joints are, shoulders, hips, elbows, knees, uh, heels, things like that in every single frame. So 60 times a second, we're identifying where are all of your joints. And then what we do is we can take that information and collect it and then we can pass it through as like a big, as a, as a time series. So we can think about how your elbow moved in relation to your left knee, in relation to your right hip. And as that moves through the process, we can do that what we're doing is we're comparing you to those NC State baseball and softball players to see how the youth players compare, and then we can give corrections. Okay, so the camera is a major component of the sensors that we use here to gather this information. As we continue to move through, then we go down and we look inside the batter's box. So in the batter's box, we have a weight sensor or a plate that has 752 sensors mounted in it. And we get back recordings of where the weight is distributed uh, many times a second, about 15 times a second. And so from that, we can then extract how much pressure did you put on your back foot as you moved your hands. And as you started to swing the bat forward, how much did you shift your weight, how hard and how fast? And did you get the optimal optimal kind of settings and weights as you move through it in order to create maximum power? And so when we couple the camera sensor with this weight sensor, we get about 50,000 data points that occur per swing. Um, and oh so God. we analyze those 50,000 points um, per swing and then in order to give you back feedback as to how you can... Uh, how, how your swing differs from a, a Division I college or baseball, college baseball or softball player to help improve that. Um, and as we roll forward a little bit more, we can see here that we'll then hit that, we'll hit the ball, and then we have a sensor mounted at the back of the cage that tracks the actual flight of the ball. And that then gives feedback, immediate feedback to the player as to how hard they hit it. In, you know, and as we're measuring the success in baseball softball from a technical perspective, again, this project had a data literacy component as well as a improving a skill component. So in the analyzing, helping them improve in their baseball and softball skills, one of the things we want to know is how hard can you hit the ball? The harder you hit it, the better, that's the, that's the judgment of how good you are um, hitting a line drive out. And so we have a sensor mount in the back that tracks the flight of the ball, then gives the player the feedback of how hard did they hit that ball? How far would it have landed? Where did it go in relation to the field? And so then we couple that together with the information um, and process that all. We send that all off once we have the information and then we give them back a set of recommendations. And so those happen every few, every few swings, we give them some feedback. So here we'll see that the player will swing through as we've calculated angles, things like that. And then here's that feedback. And so the players get back a set of charts that then show them where their hand position was when they struck the ball, what their front knee looked like, because that's a key part of how elite players hit, and then also what their hand positions were as they began to swing. And we're able to see all that, um, coupling that with the sensors, we're able to see and, and act on that in order to be able to compare these youth players to the Division I baseball and softball players at NC State. And that was made possible by using SAS event stream processing, um, specifically used a hidden Markov model um, from SAS Econometrics and coupling that with then cloud technologies in Azure and open source technologies like Python in order to kind of put this together as a whole scoring system. Okay, great. That was one question I wanted to ask a little bit more about, you know, the technology that makes this all come together. There's a lot of different pieces to the puzzle, so it's really, really cool, Jared. Thank you.
For more information on the underlying technology used for the batting lab and beyond, let's hit a line drive and go straight into the release talk with Gunjay. Gunjay, how are you doing today? Hi, Kate. I'm doing well. Thank you. We are so thrilled to have an expert like you on the show. Would you mind kicking us off first and foremost and just telling us what does the technology like PROC HMM, how does it help make the batting lab run smoothly? Yes, Kate. As you mentioned, behind the scenes of the batting lab project is one of uh, the SAS econometrics procedures called PROC HMM. PROC HMM runs hidden Marco model or HMM. Uh, this project was a very interesting application of this model. Now consider uh, a player swinging the bat. Uh, a video of such a swing contains about 100 frames. Uh, here you're seeing uh, an example. Uh, you're seeing an example of such a video. Uh, each frame contains information about the position of the player's body, like uh, knees, elbows, shoulders, um, uh, frames have a natural order. Uh, they are sorted by, t by time. Therefore, the data we obtain from these frames are time series data. We use PROC HMM to fit a hidden Marco model to learn from these data. Uh, machine learning has become very popular, especially for its great pattern recognition ability. HMMs are an important member of machine learning fam family. Uh, HMMs though have special, uh, special advantages like uh, easy interpretability and flexibility. In our case, the HMM uh, categorizes the player's moves uh, by a series of groups and labels them as the swing uh, faces or hidden states. You can consider these hidden states as uh, the driving force of a player's moves. Uh, the hidden states are connected by the transition probabilities. That is to say, uh, there is a certain probability for moving from one state to another. In each state, uh, there is a set of parameters determining how the data are generated uh, in this particular state, like mean and variable. The frames you can watch uh, from the videos are the observable variables uh, in the Should model. I... The frames you can watch from uh, the videos are the observable variables in the model. Uh, our goal, our goal is to uh, find the unobservable variables or hidden states. To do this, we first train the model. Uh, this is like trained a machine to do the coach's job. Uh, this is the stage where the model or the machine watches and learns from good players. For this stage, uh, we use data from over 500 videos from the NC State baseball team. Uh, there were many challenges with training this model. Uh, one of them being the high dimensionality of data, uh, which made the optimization quite difficult uh, to tackle this problem. We use the EM or expectation maximization algorithm, and this algorithm worked particularly well in this case. At the end, we found uh, 48 states or swing faces, if you will, that generate uh, optimal swings that we observe in these videos. For example, for one of the optimal swings we had in our data, we found eight states that explain it. Uh, you can tell it mimics a player's swing move. Of course, once we trained our model, we were ready to put our machine coach into work. Uh, now our mission was to score young players. Um, for a given swing video of a young player, we did this by scoring each frame based on the model that we trained. A frame scores low if it deviates a lot from the swing face that HMM recommends. For example, here the frame number 102 has a low score. You can tell that the shoulders are not even, the hands are in different positions, the distribution of the weight is different. 
the recommendation then can be given based on the deviations. Uh, and we can do this again and again. So we can do this in an iterative way, meaning once the young player improves their worst part of their swing, uh, we can then score their new move again and find other areas to improve. Gujay, thank you so much for that thorough explanation. This is something that I wish we had growing up playing sports. Um, I was wondering if you could elaborate a little more on how Proc HMM can be applied and what other application areas it can be used in. Sure. Uh, the batting lab project uh, was certainly an interesting application of HMM, but as you uh, asked, there are actually many other areas that uh, this procedure can be applied. For example, uh, for example, in the finance world, uh, to buy or to sell is the question. Uh, if you knew it would be a bull market, you might choose to buy the stock. Uh, if you knew it would be a bear market, you might choose to sell the stock. However, you cannot directly observe these market states. What you can observe is the stock prices. So you can use PROC HMM to discover the hidden market states from the observable stock price. In macroeconomics, uh, you can use PROC HMM for modeling the business cycles. Uh, in the policy analysis, you can use PROC HMM to study the uh, policy spatial temporal effect. Uh, this is done for using chi Chinese data revealing that the policy is moving from east provinces to the west inner provinces through time. Uh, in the IoT, you can use it for monitoring the machine status by using hidden market model to detect the abnormal state of a machine from its products. Uh, even in the healthcare industry, you can use it uh, to study, for example, the brain dynamics based on the MRI image. Great. Now, can we take one step back? Could you just give us a baseline definition of econo econometrics, please? <laughs> yeah, definitely. Certainly, Kate. Uh, econ econometrics uh, is uh, the application of statistical and mathematical methods to economic data. The aim is to explain consistently recurring relationships uh, to develop theories or test hypotheses in economics, and to forecast future trends uh, from historical data. Uh, at the end, it helps you to draw uh, quantitative conclusions like my revenue will change X dollar amount for every cent increase in the price of my product. Uh, when I mention uh, economic data, uh, don't just think of uh, financial data. Uh, this also includes uh, labor economics data, macro uh, economics or microeconomics data, uh, economic policy data, and many more. One of the biggest challenges of economic data is that they are observational. Uh, unlike the researchers in the uh, physical sciences, econometricians are rarely able to conduct controlled experiments. Uh, this raises the question of whether there is enough information in the data to identify the unknowns in the model. So econometrics uh, methods are designed uh, around this challenge. Okay, thank you. So PROC HMM is part of SAS econometrics. What other cool capabilities does SAS econometrics have? Yes, okay. Uh, SAS Econometrics uh, offers tools to model, forecast, and simulate complex economic and business scenarios using observational data. To give a few examples uh, for its capabilities, uh, it helps you uh, to model economic and business scenarios to analyze the impact of a specific event over time. It helps you model uh, customer's choice behavior. You can simulate portfolio risks and model the need to uh, capital reserves uh, for banks, for example. You can do causal inference and perform policy evaluation and policy comparison using deep neural networks. 
It offers tools for uh, data access, preparation, and visualization. As I mentioned, uh, these are just a few examples, and there are many more. So why don't we take a look at a demo for one of the cool capabilities of SaaS econometrics? One of our key features is the market attribution procedure, which calls the action market attribution. This is an important procedure because it helps businesses identify what marketing channels drive the customer conversion. In other words, which of their marketing content persuades customers to buy their product. This obviously has a huge importance to businesses because this knowledge helps them to optimize the investment on those channels so that they can allocate the advertising budget accordingly. In this example, the data table contains the records of 2 million customer visits. It has four columns. The first column, SEC, is the number to identify the customers. The second column, time, is the time when the customer visits. Column C is a non-negative integer variable that is converted from the channel variable and is to be used in model. And a column channel is the channel that the customer visits at time t. Now let's see a summary of these channels. In addition to conversion, which equals zero in c, in the c variable, uh, there are 13 distinctive channels, which include uh, direct mail, email, paid search, paid social, SMS, web, etc. Now, let's run this procedure using these data. As you can see, the syntax is quite straightforward. In the ID statement, I am specifying the customer ID for, for each observation and the temporal order of the observations. In the model statement, uh, I'm specifying the channel variable C and the number of channels uh, for this market attribution model. And in the output uh, statement, I'm saving the estimation results, such as the removal effects, uh, each channel's contribution results, and the estimated transition matrix uh, to the specified output data table. And those are actually created right here. Now let's look at the results. Here are the model information and number of observations. Here are the estimates of the initial state probability vector. And here is the estimate of the transition probability matrix. PROC market attribution fits the Markov attribution model. Uh, this model uses a first order Markov chain to calculate the probability of interaction between pairs of channels in the customer journey. So what do these values in the matrix represent? Ah, good question. So the values that you see in this matrix are the estimates of the probabilities of transforming from one state, uh, state meaning channel, to the next. So based on the calculated transition probability matrix, prop market attribution then evaluates the channel's contribution to customer conversions through this uh, so-called uh, removal effects. This is what they are. Okay. The removal effect of a channel here refers to the decrease in the probability of overall conversion if the channel were removed. In this, exam in this example, uh, channel five, if you remember channel five is organic, which is basically unpaid uh, search, web search, leads to the greatest decrease in the probability of conversion if it is missing. So in this example, it is uh, around 11%. In the last output table, you see the contributions of each channel. These are the normalized removal effects to indicate each channel's contribution to the conversion. In addition to the contributions uh, of the Markov attribution model, PROC, uh, market attribution provides the contributions obtained from the other several the so-called heuristic models. These are the first touch, last touch, linear, position-based, and time decay attribution models. This side-by-side -side view provides a convenient way of comparing these models.
Great demo. Thank you so much for sharing all of these updates, Gunje. We will certainly be on the lookout for more to come on all the fast batting rounds. All right, now I'll toss it back to Tiago. Thank you, Kate. Again, that was Gunche Walton stepping up to the plate and telling us about SAS econometrics. Keep an eye out for more developments on that and the batting lab. Now, sadly, we have run down the clock, but your SAS journey does not have to stop. If you want to be an MVP and dig even deeper, you can check out the description for more resources. And this is a monthly show. So next month, we will hang out again and talk with more people about what's new in the SaaS world. You can subscribe to the SaaS Users YouTube channel to get notified on when we go live for our next show on August 16th. But until then, I've been your host, Tiago de Souza. Keep on swinging for the fences, and we will see you next month.